I'm so glad that you've joined us today. It is around 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time that this is taking place today. And we have got some incredible teachers that are joining us today and uh, from all parts of the world, from Canada, from Africa, and different locations that you've shared in the back channel chat today. So if you can just take a chance um, and take a moment to introduce yourselves in the back channel chat and why I'd like to know um, why were you interested in this particular session today? Because this particular topic is all about budget constraints, but basically how you can transform your classroom, even just one corner at a time or a whole classroom at a time. So I'd like to know what your interest was and why you've decided to join us. That would give me some background context of, of our why today. So I'll just take a moment to give you some pause time. Oh, James, you know what? I hear that a lot from teachers, that you're spending thousands of dollars out of your own pockets each year. Absolutely, absolutely. I also am supporting you today with a great collection of funding resources and opportunities to write some grants that you could actually team up with a teacher to write or present to your school board or your administration team to apply for. So I have those also I'll share with you. And Patsy and Angela, I think you're still typing yet, but if you'd like to add in uh, why you're joining this session today and what you're looking for or any immediate need or strategy that would help me to really customize our session today. Yes, Nigeria. Yes, Patsy. Excellent. Glad you're so here. Uh, she's she's fascinated with class themes and board displays. Okay, you're in charge of the school. Okay, to design a beautiful spaces and themes without spending so much money. Well, then you've landed in the right space today. I am so glad that you're here with us, Patsy. I've got lots of design ideas for you. Kathy, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here as well. We just offered an introduction question basically and gave a welcome, but also would like to know that you've joined us today on learning about transforming your classroom spaces on a budget. So we'd like to know what your interest is or your need is today, or your interest of why you've chosen this topic to join in today. And that way I can really customize our sessions for each of you. Okay. And prior to now the archived reflection, you'll see at the top of the conversation that I've added the master slide deck for you that you should be able to see. So it is there plus a support resources on, it's called um, Bloom Your Room. I had a really great conversation with Dr. Lynn Kinney this morning who lives about 15 minutes from me. And uh, she's got some great resources to actually add in to complement how you set up your classroom. So I thought I want to give you those bonus materials too. Well, let's get started. And I'm going to make this full screen so each of you can see this larger. Okay. But once again, um, welcome everyone. A lot of you have been in my sessions already, so you know who I am. Um, I'm a very proud educator. I'm a STEM innovation specialist, and I actually hold a lot of different ambassadorships as certifications because I'm very passionate about when we design spaces in the classroom that we also provide the educational learning experiences that are hands-on to build lifelong learning confidence with each and every one of our students with differing abilities. So I'm very passionate about building literacy, especially um, book creator is a great tool if you haven't tapped into to create your own stories. Teachers can use, but especially students. Um, I love everything to do with Lego. Anything hands on at any given time can really help the conversation and the collaboration between students in the classroom. But I especially love working with coding and making in circuitry 
um, components and helping students really create their own inventions. And that's what Makey Makey can do for you. So if you have not seen what a Makey Makey is, you basically can go to instructables.com slash Makey Makey. And we have a whole teacher's hub there that you can create amazing inventions, just amazing. And once again, and today's slide deck is here that if you'd like to tap into that, I have this shortened link here and I have the shortened link at the end of the presentation and it should be within our back channel chat as well. Now let's have the conversation first and then I'm gonna make sure that I pause that we can process and then you can apply information today because we'd like to make those learning connections. But a lot of times teachers ask me, well, when designing spaces, where do I even start? But the first thing I always have teachers do, I say, let's take a few steps back because where to start, we truly need to identify what is our purpose and what is our why? Is it because we only wanna beautify the space because our teacher friend next to us is? or you saw a really neat space in a school visit somewhere else. There always need to be defined a purpose and a why because it needs to be impacting student development, brain development, and also to allow students to be more successful in learning in those spaces. So the bigger picture is these are the conversations that I normally have with teachers when I'm with them face to face. We really try to find out their purpose and their why. A lot of times teachers will say, well, we have some academic areas that we're in need of improvement. So because there's this need of improvement, we really need to define a space that we can concentrate more heavily and with more engagement for our students to understand, apply, and show what they know. So I usually ask the teachers, you know, is it a focus on literacy that you want to create? Is it communication or collaboration? Is it something to do with problem solving or critical thinking? You know, is it need to be part of a STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math initiative? And I always focus, what is the best for your students' needs? The other areas that I focus on too, is sometimes teachers are having trouble with classroom management and also how to help students and model to students to stay time on task. So because of that, we really model some effective rotation stations, what the workflow can look like, how to transition, and then how to empower students to clean up that space and be responsible learners to ensure everything is put back in its place. The other thing that I really like with designing spaces is when you really put students in the center, we really want to allow for them to have more choice and voice in their learning. We want to empower them to take student ownership and that they're driving part of that learning so they feel that there's a value add and there's a purpose why they're in this environment. And again, I said um, earlier, there's opportunities also for dedicated spaces that you transform to really enrich activities for each and every student that they can find their genuine interest or something that they're very passionate about. And that's what we need to really help our students with moving forward. Now I had a, just a very brief conversation earlier with James that was online and he's still in the back channel chat area. And James had also mentioned that going back when they go back to school that there's a, a very clear focus that social emotional learning will be a major component to really focus on a learner centered practice in their school. So because of that, you may also want to have more brain friendly resources to support the learning, making sure that our children are feeling safe, more opportunities for that student choice and voice to build a stronger community of collaborative learners. And because of the pandemic that we're in, there's been a lot of trauma that's taken place with our students. Some children are filled with anxiety because they haven't gotten an opportunity to physically connect with you as a teacher. They may be now in a home environment or where they're say, staying at that maybe may not be the safest for them. And being away from school was their safe haven and now in their home environment, it's not the best environment for them. So social emotional learning needs to 
always be, I would say, at the forefront of everything that we do now. And I agree with schools that should be a priority so that we can help build just a resilient culture of children moving forward. Because even though we're in the pandemic right now, we're going to face other types of trauma moving futuristically. And how can we help our students become basically resilient, but strong enough that they can continue to move on and find success in their learning? Now, my question to each of you, I'd like to know what is your purpose and your why to transform your teaching and learning spaces for your students? Now, I know, Patsy, you had said right away that you're kind of in charge of beautifying those spaces. So what is your purpose and your why? I'd like to know a little bit more so you can tell me your story. So as you're doing that, I'm going to look in the back channel chat, and I'd love to have you answer or give me some tidbits of information of what you're sharing. So I I'm going to tap back into my, over my other device here. I'm going to tap right on the chat area and look and just to see what you're sharing. Okay. Okay, excellent. So Kathy, she says, I would like to see some ideas to include social distancing in my small room layout. And I think that's gonna be the, probably the biggest challenge more than anything, because when we look at best practices, we really want our students to be highly communicative and highly collaborative learners. And usually that means in close proximity. So we've got to come up with some very creative ways. I do have a few pictures that we'll discuss and share that are visuals that I think might give you some insight, Kathy, today. That would be great. Susan, welcome. And Rosa, I'm glad you've joined the conversation. So glad that you've joined us today, ladies and gentlemen. And please share with us at this time. I want to know what your purpose is. Even if it's like I call it a pie in the sky, you know, what's your why? Why do you want to transform a space? Even if it's one space, one corner, or part of your classroom, what would be your purpose and what would be your why? Some of you are still chatting in the back that it's coming in. Okay. Well, as those ideas are coming in, we will continually to refer to them to apply to the next visuals that I'm going to be showcasing to you. My chat seems to not maybe be coming up as fast as maybe what yours is. So I'll come back and refer to that. But here are some pictures to get started with that are very, very cost effective, very simple to get started with and setting up. And at times when I work with teachers, um, we also talk about teachers as being the new designers in the classroom. So you're wearing a new hat, a mentoring ship hat, you're a life coach when these kids come back, but also you're a designer. The more organized that you can have things accessible to your students and a little bit even more detailed of the literacy component, it will make that classroom space just sparkle. It'll be wonderful. Now, this one is a very, very basic, low budget classroom corner that's been set up. You can see that we've got some nice, just it's just a, a very soft beige color on the walls because that's the standard color in the school district and they had to follow the code for that. They couldn't paint, they couldn't do anything else like that. But what you'll see is this particular teacher uses this as a literacy and also it is a creation corner. She has taken milk crates that she has transformed into small seating chairs. And what they did is they just have a piece of plywood and then they have just a soft foam cushion. And then she folded over the fabric and stapled the fabric on top. That's all she did. And then she got it to fit on top of the milk crate. Those seating cushions can come off and each one of those also stores the creation and craft supplies in there. 
So it works as dual purpose. She can easily tear down the space and they can move all of the seats to over to the side of the wall and she can transform that space into something else for large movement activities for these students. She usually does um, reading as well with these students here and then she has guest speakers come in. So that's why there's usually a dual chair that she has. She's kept it really, really low key, non-distracting. It's kind of nice because you don't self just be bopping all over with the visuals. But this was just an introductory space of what she wanted to change. Now, another one, this is truly a corner of the classroom. What this teacher did was bring out her kidney tables. Some of these kidney tables, which they're known for, are kind of like a shape of a kidney. And it may even be back in your janitor's closet. When you think about that, there's a storage area. Some of these have been put away for years. I would say bring them back out. It's really nice because this could be an area that you could be a facilitator to small group of learning, or this is where students can be a facilitator to other students in learning. So it's a great way that students can be peer coaches to others. This classroom, again, is set up next to the window. Now I've got some natural light coming in. That's what's pretty nice about this. So this complements like the other space that the other teacher had set up, and this is a different classroom within the same building of what they've done. They also will have different soft types of seating and then very much accessible materials at the level for the children. And these are for second and third grade classrooms or children that are seven and eight years old. Here's another quick, simple space. This was very creative. This was done in a fourth, fifth grade classroom. And this teacher wanted to build in a cityscape and almost like an adventure or a travel nook, you could say. Um, this was set up in an area of a very rural and impoverished school district, and they were really out in the countryside. So what she wanted to do was to build in the look and feel that they had a cityscape to experience this with their students. And you can see that she had large size handkerchiefs is what these are. She filled them with pile filling, and then she actually sewed them into like a pillow, but then she uses them um, for a seating cushion for the students. And then she just has the little suitcases just as a visual aid, but I think she does have some pencils and pens and paper as storage in there too. So just a very small nook, very small area. She usually has three or four students at a time in this space. Now, here's some other things to think about. Milk crates work really well that you can transform them into instant seating areas. But better yet, on the left side, look at the types of milk crates that are there. She actually put wheels underneath the milk crates because you can actually screw them in so then kids can actually move around on the seating area. You'll have to set up your classroom management because you'll have some kids that will really want to rock on those seats or zoom around. So you'll have to set up kind of a structured, um, your structured norms for your students that they agree upon of when they can wiggle, meaning away from that table area. Some kids always have the wiggles and that's fine. But I mean, sometimes they'll otherwise they'll be gliding all over the place. It's kind of nice because they can store underneath that table. This is a different type of kidney table and some of you may have access to these. But here's something to think about. Um, earlier mentioned, I think it was Kathy that you had said, well, how can I set some of this up as a safe social distancing area? These types of tables on the right could possibly work. That if you have one student in one space on one side and one on the other, that you could be six feet or more apart. It just depends how far apart or how wide that table is. The other thing, this teacher has the little green dots. Those are basically, they're called dry, idea paint dots. Those dots can be painted in a circle or you can actually put them down as a dry erase sticker. So kids can draw, create, and mark up as they are solving a problem. Or if you're working on a literacy component with them, if they're working on word wall or choice words or fluency, they can actually have some writing space. But the dots can work well of helping students know 
how they should be spaced out. In an ideal setting, without the pandemic being a problem, you could easily get in your elementary classroom up to six children. But now maybe it's only two, you know, if that. So thinking differently, but giving some organization and detail of knowing where kids can sit, but spacing themselves so they're just cognizant of the other individual. Other things, again, these are some more milk crates that have been transformed into seating cushion areas as just a very, very small nook because that teacher didn't have very much in a room. The other one on the very bottom, you'll see uh, this gentleman teacher used the same thing, but really color coordinated. Um, his room, almost like a soccer theme is what he was going for. He wanted the black, the white, and the red. And so you'll see little splashes of those throughout that's consistent, but it's not distracting. And then he, as the educator, meets with his learning groups to support the literacy component in doing small group work. And then this other part of his classroom, the kids are actually in different types of invention centers when they're designing and creating. Here's another one. This is more for a high school. And this is a room that has been just um, transposed that they actually created a focal wall. So the focal wall over where the windows are is an aqua teal color. Aqua teal is a very calming, calming color. And what that does, it helps bring quietude and centralization and calming to children. So they have central wall in that. You can also see out because there isn't natural light in this room, but they could see out into the library space. This is a study space where a teacher can still come in, where students have, can work at the computers. So again, if we adequately space this out, you could have a few children if they were spaced appropriately over on the longer tables with the computers. You could actually have each of the students sit in a couch area or if they each had their individual bean bag and spaced appropriately, that would also help. And then the teacher here that is just kind of monitoring the situation of what he's doing, he's uh, looking at the conversations of how the kids are creating and making online right now. Here's a few other things too. I really like this space because this is in one corner of a classroom, which again is bringing in that natural light, getting in some natural vitamin D. The teacher brought in repurposed or recycled outdoor furniture cushions. So that's what that is. They're very, very durable. Underneath where there's where they're on top of, I should say, the underneath planks, those are created and made out of recycled uh, pallets that were then sanded down and painted. And these were done in the technology education shop with the children at the high school. So that was very interesting. So this was a whole school project. And they used repurposed materials because they were very, very cognizant of dollars, what they had, but they wanted to involve the high school kids to help these um, these were upper elementary students as fourth and fifth grade. What you'll also see the border here, she's got a nice rug at the, at the floor too, so the kids can sit on the rug, but they have a book selection choice. Now in that book selection choice, what she has is she's got little tongue depressors in a circle uh, jar there where she has a little bin um, and they can pick and choose which number it is or what she has, she has QR codes that are not quite seen in this picture, but I wanted to add it here because they're off to the side where they're sitting. And the kids can actually scan that QR code to take them to that book. And then essential questions are posed where kids can create their new ending to the story, or there's questions related to the character, the plot, or the setting, or it'll be an activity for kids to create and design. So there's lots of choices here. So it's a little bit different, but it helps kids be more self-directed. And then they document also which book they chose and the why, and they complete that activity. Here's one more I'd like to share with you. You probably have seen this. This has been all over the internet. I thought this was very creative and this was in a library media space. So again, spacing out items of activities and helping students safely socially distance could possibly work if you have dedicated spaces in your library media center. You'll see on the far back wall on the right, you've got that ep epic Lego building wall. So now the kids are building right now on that vertical axis instead of a horizontal axis, and that's a whole different perspective. 
You have another child in the back that's actually working with some pin dropping and mapping and some scaling. We have another child sitting right in the center that he's designing and building and creating. And then the children that are on the floor actually are doing a demo test um, with some robotics actually. So there can be a very creative way to socially distance. And what I like to do too, that if you can actually put some of your activities on the vertical, just like they did of the Epic Lego wall or the mapping activity on the other side, you could actually use many walls inside of your classroom. But also don't forget about, we call them learning streets. Learning streets are the quick access right outside your hallway doorway. Learning streets should be areas too that kids can appropriately space themselves and have activities that they can create, make, build, or work on safely too. So let's pause a minute. That's a lot of information I just gave you. But I'd like to know what were some maybe design elements of ideas that I just shared with you that resonated with you and why? And how could you use just one of these new ideas to transform the learning in your classroom? So I'll give you just a, a minute to reflect on that as I look over at the chat on the side here. But again, if you could reflect on this, what, what, what kind of just inspired you to think, gosh, I could try that. This could possibly work. And getting back to your previous questions, because I know that you were still reflecting. And James, I really like how you're incorporating the social emotional learning, 100% in agreement, that whole child approach and um, respecting and acknowledging that those children bring their gift of their unique individual selves into your classroom every day and to help build their confidence to feel safe. That is so important. Perfect. Yeah, Rosa, I agree. I'm very much a collaborative classroom teacher too. My experience from being a kindergarten teacher and then a fourth, fifth grade looping teacher and then also a technology coordinator, we just had everything in groups. We had small pods all the time and pods meaning I had either dynamic duos or transformative trios or we called them amazing quads. Now they're gonna have to be spaced out a little bit more and I'm sad to say it's gonna look like more of a traditional classroom. But I think what we could challenge our thinking though about is what can we do to still afford our children the dynamic learning experiences, kind of more on an individual level, but if there's space far enough between, the students could still have a very dynamic, creative and collective conversation together too. That's something to think about, yeah. Wonderful. And Susan, too, you want to make sure that you are impacting change um, and policies and you want some safe practices in place. And, and that's going to be really up to us as teachers, too, that we have to model more than ever before. And we have to use our words as well to model that uh, with our students. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And Patsy's liking some of the designs. See, some of them are very simplistic, but at the same time, I just think the art of fabric, when you think of that, that beautiful um, art textile, we call, call it, and the beautiful designs, oh my goodness, you could, you could create beautiful, beautiful seat cushions. You could tie in different areas, too, to create a customized color palette that's not too distracting, could, could be rich and full of life. We're going to share the why for color in a minute because I have some color theory research I'd like to share with you, too. Okay, and Jenna, thank you so much. You just joined our conversation as well that I'm seeing in the back channel chat. Okay, keep those ideas coming in because I'd love to learn more from you about your design elements that you really liked. And then what's one new idea that you would like to try to transform the learning, the learning in your classroom? Okay, let's look at this. The big piece of information when I work with school districts a lot, they'll say, I want to do this, I want to do that, and I want to make sure I do this. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but, but we have to come back to a reality check. What's your budget? We always have to start with our budget. What's our budget? You know, so we already defined, we need to find our, our, define our purpose and why, and then we need to define our budget. And we have to stick with our budget. And that's where it's really important. That's a life skill too. That's why involving your students on the front end to help with designing these spaces and actually working with the budget 
that's the best life skill you can give any students and to build these experiences to help them be lifelong learners. So the other thing, it's really important that I mentioned already, we've got to make sure that kids are involved in this process because if we're designing spaces because of this is what we like and this is how comfortable we are as a teacher, that's one thing. But what's most important, students want a choice and a voice in their learning spaces because we may not truly understand how they learn best or why they learn best and where they learn best. So we should be asking those questions. So here's some things that I've worked with students in the past with. If you haven't, haven't done any of these, these are great activities. And I did include the link of the Edutopia blog. And I do have this link at the end of the presentation today too. But when redesigning spaces, it doesn't have to involve all the tech all the time, but even simplistic methods of using sticky dots, of finding out, you know, how would you describe yourself first and foremost as a student? You know, how do they learn best? How do they create? Are they an inventor? Are they a maker? Are they a musician? Are they an engineer? Are they a gamer? You know, we, we should, we've got to find out what makes our kids tick. Because when we find out how our kids best learn in the classroom, we could design some really creative spaces that have a theme that runs through it that really represents each of our children. The other thing is too, when you pose those essential questions of what types of spaces do you want to design in your classroom, whether it's based on a theme, whether it's based on a STEM topic or maker spaces or literacy, we need to get that input from kids. So simple post-it notes to help tell their story and the reflection is important. The more ownership that you give the students on the front end that they feel that they're being valued by their voice and you're listening to them, and then those design concepts are helped constructed, the kids will respect the space in the classroom more. They're gonna model more appropriate citizenship behavior in your classroom, but then also having them involved in the social norms of how do we act in this learning space having those agreements set up and helping kids be responsible for setting out, co-teaching other students and picking up and cleaning up part of their whole social community responsibility. Here's some other things if you haven't used this before. Um, Pear Deck is a great solution and I use it quite often in some of my sessions that you'll see that when we do our pause and reflex, you, Pear Deck will allow for you to actually type in your response, draw in your response, or even like this one, you can do a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And it overlays with uh, working with PowerPoint or if you're using it also in Google Slides, it, it works really, really well. But the more voice that we can give to our students, the more active participation, the more ownership, they're gonna respect you as a teacher more in your classroom and they're gonna feel empowered to keep even their classmates basically in check, as we call it. Because if somebody's acting out or doing something they shouldn't be, students appreciate that space and they don't want somebody to ruin it. So once again, Post-its, Visual Dots are great. Microsoft Forms, what a beautiful way to do a quick survey with your students and to have a team of students that you design and create the forms together. So making sure you're asking the right questions. And then from there, distribute that form out to get feedback from your students. Here's one more tool if you haven't seen before. Uh, there's a portion on here that's free, and then there's a portion on here that's paid, but it's called Thrively. I really like it because it really focuses on the whole child, and it really identifies a child's unique strengths, their interest, what they're passionate about, um, which particular skill set that they want to focus on, and what they're interested in futuristically, too. You know, what kind of careers, what kind of passions, or what type of making activities are they involved in and what they like? Like even outside the school day, so we can better get to know our students. So again, this is called Thrively. This is a, a really great tool to help you personalize the learning and also personalize the learning within your new spaces that you're creating. So now I have another question for you. I'd like to know, um, also about a new strategy that you could now use to involve your students to be an act, to have an active voice basically and choice in their creation and design of the new learning spaces. I wanna know 
how would you involve your students? Would you introduce them as a conversation? Would it be that you would use a post-it note strategy? What would you do differently? And what type of strategy would you, would you use to involve your students in designing these new spaces? So I'm gonna give you a pause and reflect moment. And if you could share your um, collective intelligence to see how you would do this. Or lastly, maybe you've already tried an idea that's really worked and we haven't discussed it yet. So if you could add it to the back channel chat, that would be great. And getting, I'm going to look back in here. Oh, what did you call the quads? We call them amazing quads. Amazing quads, kind of like your amazing hero, like super trooper teams. <laughs> yep, dynamic duos, transformative trios, and amazing quads. Yep. Okay. Yes, I agree. Patsy says labeling shelves would also help with independence. Yes, the more rich print text, that's very important. That's a really good idea that you brought up, Patsy. It's helping our kids be more active in reading and also knowing where to put things away. Excellent. Also, James is saying that you have a kidney table um, and you see teachers, you normally sit at them. Yes, that's what I've seen. But when you can take that empowerment I should say, when, when you can take that strategy of what you know works best, but then empower your students to now be a peer coach to others, that's when the learning really takes place. That's what's wonderful. Yes. So continue to add in your thoughts about strategies at this time, about how you would involve your students. It would be great to see any other ideas that you've come up with or a different solution um, that we didn't discuss. Okay. Here are some more ideas for you too, and I cannot reiterate enough, but we really truly have to listen to our students, but we have to listen to you as teachers too. So when you're going to be transforming your classroom space, whether it's just one corner, whether it's outside your classroom as a learning street, or whether it's an entire classroom, you should also not have to feel like you gotta do this alone. I would team up with another teacher friend I always say two brains is better than one. So why not collaborate as a dynamic duo or have three of you as a transformative trio and come up with a design concept that you could actually design and create in one classroom with your students and pilot that first for a month, see how it goes. And if it goes really well, replicate it in each of those classrooms and then have the students help set it up too, which would be wonderful. Or maybe you learn from that space, it's like, oh, that didn't go so well. We need to do something else. So because of that, then you're not wasting time and effort with putting it in three classrooms at one time. But sometimes a simple pilot of even two weeks or up to four weeks can really help strengthen the best approach of how you would deploy this then in other spaces. Now, when you look at these spaces, we have a lot of teachers that I've worked with, especially in the Midwest states, when we say that, like Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin, that for a while, they had no budget dollars at all to do anything with new learning spaces. But they did get approval from their administrative team that they could bring in even gently used couches or chairs that met a certain grade because in the United States it's called OSHA compliance. And this OSHA compliance needs to have a type of like a fire grade material. And sometimes really high end couches already have that built into them. And even if they're gently used, they will still meet that requirement. But students want to relax. And when students relax, it helps and allows them to be more open to learning, to think more deeply about content, but then also helps them feel that they are safe in your learning space. Now the space over to the right, which is the large picture, I mean, that clearly is within your library learning spaces. I could see more beanbag type chairs that meet the fabric requirements that you can have in your school district that it's OSHA compliant or otherwise. And that would, that would truly identify 
a space for children, which would meet our social distancing guidelines. So that could be another result. And a lot of our kids love these chairs because they kind of feel like they're lounging, they're relaxed. But again, we want to reiterate that feeling that it's safe here to learn. You have a choice where you're sitting. And then at the same time, they can get comfy. And what a better way than to grab a great book or to listen to an audio um, feed if you've done a flipped teaching lesson or if it's a story that's an audible. The very last picture down in the very, uh, let's see, bottom left corner, um, that's a teacher friend that they have other cubbies outside in their learning streets of their classroom. So we call them little cubbies because it's just this little call out area. So they usually have two or three chairs. You could create those right outside of your hallway, right in your learning street area, outside of your classroom. And those, po those are possibilities of different types of chairs that you could do. So something to think about, but if you have space, sometimes our hallways aren't too big. So you got to make sure that you meet the fire marshal code too. So that's that's another thing to think about. Here's another project that we did when I was back in our Midwest schools is what they did is because the school district said that you had to meet the ocean compliance of fabric that had to be on these types of seats or chairs or couches. So what they did is they worked with the face group which is basically the fine arts and career um, education group, which is at the high school, or we use some of our tech ed classes. But even better yet, we actually had some experts from the community that came in that did um, local upholstering that would redo chairs in general to come in and teach the high school kids how to do this. And they're kind of their tech ed shops and maker spots. And then the high school kids would partner with the elementary and middle school and they would mentor them to repurpose furniture to be basically be more green and sustainable of reusing items instead of filling up our landfills. So this was a really unique project because the kids not only got to help design that classroom space, they also did the whole color palette and collection of what that space is gonna look like. So they did a draft and a design. And then from there, then they added the fabric to the existing structures or the bones of the chairs and the couches that they could repurpose. It was very, very cost effective. Here's another great solution. Um, Deb Norton is a teacher as a technology integration specialist now in the Oshkosh School District in Wisconsin. And way in the far, far, uh, I would say east side of Wisconsin. And when she was in the fifth grade classroom, when I first met her, like over 10, 12 years ago, she too wanted to do some unique types of learning and different types of mobilization in her classroom, but to get the kids up and out of their seats. Because as we know, when kids are up and out of their seats, they get more oxygen filled blood to their brain, which makes them more alert, more creative and all of that. So because of this, what you're gonna see here, this is actually a cart on wheels. And if you see on the very edge of this on the left side, that's wrapped of the power cord. Now, many of us still have these in our school districts because we used to put our overhead transparency projectors on these. So what Deb did is because they, they found out later they had about 20 or 25 of these stored away in the janitor's closet for all the extra supplies and they were just collecting dust because everybody was putting in these overhead projectors from the ceiling for their LCD projectors. What she did, and with her students, this is wonderful because the students helped with this. They did the measurement around the entire, um, the, the, they, I should say, they did the measuring of the entire rectangle on the outside of the whole perimeter of this cart. Then they had fabric that they also purchased, which you can buy some that comes pre-quilted uh, with elastic, or you can actually use a piece of fabric and a piece of elastic and then sew that in. And then when you put that all the way around, then there's Velcro in the inside. So what she did then, not only did she have a cart that was on wheels that could kids could stand and work together on this cart. So she usually had them as a dynamic duel, or there were times that sometimes kids just needed just their single time. And because of that, it worked out well too. Underneath the cart, you'll see that that's where she kept all of her storage for supplies and materials. 
So sometimes you set these up as learning rotation stations. And the learning rotation stations, which was nice for this, is because the supplies are right underneath. The kids would take them out and put them on top, and then they could create, and they could make, and they could build. And then if they needed power, they could always go back to the power strip that could be plugged into an outlet, um, but being monitored by the teacher. So this is a really cost-effective strategy. Now, here's another one if you haven't seen this. Um, Any time that you can utilize the walls in your classroom or on the outskirts of your classroom too for a visual thinking area. Idea paint is a type of paint that you can paint on any type of surface and becomes an instant dry erase board. You can also go to your local hardware store or like a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Um, different places of that sort, and you can buy gallons of paint that are for dry erase boards as well. But what's nice about this is that you can create a whole mural as an idea they have here. But let's say I pose an essential question or a content question based on the unit of study that we're working on. Kids can then sketch note and connect larger mind maps together of what they're thinking and ideas that they brainstorm. You could still safe socially distance with this activity. Just think if you could have one whole wall in your room that would have this on, and then you could space the children out, and then they can actually draw, create, and make at a given time. So that's something to think about too. Here's another way that we've used this. Um, to reiterate uh, math literacy in your classroom, an explanation of a problem when students work in teams of two or three or even separately as a single, you can take the same idea paint and it works on the tabletops of your desks. So once again, please always ask your administrator that if you can resurface your desks and use this type of paint and it works as a dry erase, it is guaranteed to stay on for seven years so it lasts for quite a while. The only thing I would say again, please always ask that this is okay to do. We've even had some teachers say, could I bring in an older table that you've refurbished and you've made sure that the, the top is very smooth. And we've had some teachers actually put that idea paint or the dry erase paint on top and used it as a center as well. So that's another thing to think about if you'd like to use it that way. The very bottom left corner, that's again another math literacy corner, that kids are using their little connect blocks and then they are working on standard base 10 with their math literacy skills and then they're actually documenting how many they have and then they write on the table and then they actually take a snapshot of it and it's saved right to their Seesaw account is what they're doing so they're working on that math literacy. So on this one corner, this is taking place. On another corner, they're actually reflecting on the whole process of understanding at our high schools and middle school kids. And then you can also incorporate literacy on the other end of the table. So everything ties in so nicely. We have a lot of teachers that use this over existing chalkboards. And yes, we have a lot of chalkboards left in the United States and internationally. But what a better way to make it a dry erase space and then kids can use that as a think tank area. Teachers can use it as a dry erase board, or you can help with kids with brainstorming and sketch noting. And again, the whiteboard dry erase paint that you can get at your local hardware store, they, they range in the US dollars around 30 to $50, and it can actually paint a whole wall. The idea paint is much more costly, and those range because it's a bigger container, but you can do multiple walls, or it depends what type that you want because you can get different colors and different uh, grades of the material of the paint that you can use. Now, here's another space. Um, many of you probably have different types of video setups that are currently taking place, but even if you can use um, different types of TVs or other areas that might be also back in storage, why not take it out if it's working, but if it's also clear and it works with the content that ties into the theme that you're teaching. Now, this would be like the ideal situation, right? It's beautiful. There's a dual monitor. They're reading a book. The story's being read. And then the kids are sitting together and having a smaller group moment. Well, that would be ideal. For this situation now, 
I may have to pull three of those chairs out and only two children sit across from each other. And then I could have one visual literacy component in the middle where the children can still read, hear the story read to them, and then reflect on their learning. So that's another thing to think about, creating those information literacy hubs supported with video and audio. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about color as, as we transition into this. And color can really set the tone of the thinking and creation space within your environment. Because color has a story all on its own. Like even the splashes of the bright tangerine orange here. Tangerine orange really gives the reflection of color as high creativity, lots of energy, lots of excitement. White in general is okay as it's kind of like they call it that monotone. It's more clean. It's more of a sterile uh, playback of that. But pops of color can make your environment extremely, extremely creative. But too many pops of color, too many bulletin boards, too many poster boards all over can be too distracting. So again, less is more. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. I have a supportive document here for you today, and this is um, the Research Color Guide. And this is being pulled from the best practices of brain research. And what does color theory research mean to us as humans and how, it, how we react to it? Now, I mentioned that aqua teal earlier in that middle school, high school study room. Well, that's where it's really reflective, that our blues and our greens are really a calming color. It provides us a sense of security, quietude, and inner balance. And what's interesting about this, it actually helps kids regulate their body temperature. It's, it's a known fact. It helps them with their breathing techniques. And even if you're doing meditation or if you're uh, modeling yoga with your students, blue is a great central color to focus on. But now, if I have that orange, orange is the best to stimulate learning. It's for really active participation. It's for getting up and moving around. It's for having creative conversations with your students. Yellow, on the other hand, is a sense of optimism and hope. It still is calming, but it's just bright and cheery. Sometimes red, big, broad, big bright splashes of red um, can be okay. It can be engaging, but sometimes it can get pretty wild. So you got to be how much you use red in a color at a given time. Brown and, and darker colors sometimes actually don't, do not necessarily support the calming technique, but like the really dark colors, if it's too dark gray, if it's almost like black, um, they say it can lower stress that people need some of that, but then at the same time, it sets a different type of emotional tone of feeling within a student. So you'll have to really see if, if it does add peacefulness or if it adds something else. So think, thinking about those colors. Now, here's some other pictures that I wanted to share with you too. This is a very interesting kidney table. Um, this is coming out of the UK, and that particular one is where there's an inside kidney kind of and an outside kidney, and they're joined as one like a circle eight. So kids can do all kinds of creation and making. You may have seen some of these in the children's museums. Um, we see those a lot in those spaces to maximize so kids can get up and about and moving around. If you're so fortunate to, the, to do that, you could probably get anywhere from four to maybe six children. It depends how large that is, but on the outer skirts of this table instead of the inner to the other. Interesting enough, these little pods in the very bottom lower right corner, this is a different design space that kids kind of have their own little cubbies. And this was built just for kids as reading nooks outside of a li or inside of a library area. So they had their own little cubbies, kind of like They've showcased on Google before, um, and at the Googleplex, they have some things that you have your own personal space. I think it would be great if our classrooms were large enough and every one of our children could have their own personal swing or a hammock. You know, they're in their space and to keep it um, as a space to relax. But in an ideal world, right, we could have that. But um, we'll have to see moving forward what takes place. Okay, here's another area for our middle school and high school students. Some of you may have this as well. Um, you can partition some spaces in between your uh, single, I call them singleton or your dynamic dual learning spaces. 
A lot of times these are made for two children at a time. They can bring bean bag chairs in and then truly collaborate. More schools are putting up these little borders in between as natural spaces so kids can actually be separated and socially distanced um, effectively together. We are seeing some of that already taking place right now, but kids can still kind of see each other, but then there's a small border. So that's another um, possibility that you may want to look into. Now, many of you probably have seen the different steel case chairs and a lot of these different uh, types of chairs that move, that have wheels on. They can be quite costly, but it's really kind of nice too because you can set up your classroom in many different dynamic ways. Because again, it, it's natural, you can set them up in dynamic duos, transformative trios, or those amazing quads, but then you can break them apart to socially distance as well. They do take up space, you know, they're a little bit larger than a desk, but they have the, the I should say, the, the little desk template that comes up and then can also um, fold down to the side and then underneath they can put their studies, uh, notebooks, backpacks, and stuff like that. Here's another one, um, cause this is coming from Atlanta, Georgia area. This room is like a double room. It's very, very long and very, very deep. But what's interesting, the color palette that they've chosen here, we've got great dynamics of blue. So the blue is the calming, the resting, but also feels helping kids feel safe. We see we've got some partner shares over here that they're working on literacy, they're reading, but it has natural light. We have our children right up in the front on the left side. They're creating and making. So you'll see that they've got some red chairs here, and that's for high creativity and energ energizing. And the teacher usually will say, um, group one will be going to the blue zone. Group two will be going to the red zone. And then group three will be going to the green zone, which is beyond that. And that's another calming area where they have a listening center and a video creation center actually set up. And the children way in the back at the other red zone there, they're doing small group collaborative maker work is what they're doing. Now, the other thing I wanted to add as part of our closing is even the most essential element of a water fountain adds pure calmness to your classroom. And why I say that is because it's the sound it's the emotional tone that it leaves the students with and even you as a teacher. But even when the students see it, water. Water is really talking about hydration, right? We need, we, our brains are made 80% up out of water. So because of that, we need to stay hydrated. But at the same time too, water gives us this calming and soothing tone um, that it's when it's in a fountain. A lot of teachers that I work with have this in their classroom and they especially turn it on during independent reading time or it can also come in and be turned on during this time for transitions. So if you're completing an activity and assignment and you're leading into something else, the teacher may turn the fountain back on and all of a sudden the kids hear the ripple. They know it's time to close out of this activity and then we're going to make a segue into our next activity. And the teacher doesn't even have to say what she's doing because the tone and the sound are the cue for the classroom management in the class in the classroom. If you haven't tapped into already, the Calm app is just absolutely brilliant. You can go to calm.com or use Calm on your phone. And what's beautiful about this, it gives a beautiful visual playback of landscapes from all over the world and has some quite soothing music that you can set it up for meditation breaks, yoga breaks, or just some easy listening in between the types of maybe complex work or stressful work that you have to, you have to be working on with your students. You can set it up for two minutes, five, 10, 15, 20, and so on. But it's a great teaching tool that really connects with a lot of our students. So I wanted to make sure that you got all of these resources. Remember, I said everything is here. So what we have, not only do I have additional funding resources, there's lots of grants that are out there. Sometimes it only takes one page to fill out and that you can apply for a $500 or a $5,000 grant. Others, such as like Donors Choose, you create a project online and then you choose what you'd like to fulfill your classroom with supplies or materials and then you market basically that out. And a lot of individuals from major corporations like to come in and help fund those donor choose projects. Always what we're seeing major funding happening 
is around uh, the end of the school year because that's teacher awareness week within the United States. We're also seeing it when you go back to school in August because a lot of corporations know that schools do not have budgets. So a good time to also apply would be creating one of those projects now and then having it done by August and market that out and most likely you'll get funded. Um, starting small is better. Usually the first time $1,000 of US dollars or less, you most likely get funded. And the more times that you get funded, the more then you can apply for a larger amount coming forth um, into the next years. I've got some teaching tolerance education grants that are out there. Inspiration for instruction classroom grants are there. I also have all kinds of bonus things. So besides, this is just the physical things that you could do for constrained, um, I'm sorry, budget constrained classrooms that you're trying to redesign. I do a lot with brain friendly learning spaces. So if you wanna take it to the next level, I've included my entire slide deck as well there that gives you all kinds of best practices and research to really focus on social emotional learning and brain friendly classrooms. I also included, it's called Get Active. Reimagining, sorry, reimagining learning spaces for student success. That was designed and created by K through 12 Blueprint and Clarity Innovations from the United States. It's all on the best practices of why you design your space and targeted especially on student success. I've got some other great links that are in there for you too. And then I also have one that if you are looking to create maker spaces or STEM learning hubs, I have one in there just on maker spaces that I've delivered too. So I want to give you all of those best practices. So once again, teacher friends, thank you so much for joining us today. You can always email me. You can direct message me on Twitter or follow me on Twitter. You can go to my website. I have all kinds of other re resources there. If you're looking for more resources, Twitter hashtags for this event between Microsoft and Q is remember it's called Geta or Microsoft EDU or it's called We Are Q. And you're gonna see all of the great learning taking place from all of the presenters. And again, um, our slide deck, oh, I see it must've got cut off there, um, has been included as we saw at the beginning of the uh, presentation, but also included in the resources. So thank you so much everyone for joining. And I'm going to just bebop uh, out of this slide and what I'll do for you, that if you have any questions, I'd be glad to stay on and to answer any questions that you may have. You're more than welcome to turn on your mics if you have more questions, um, not a problem at all. And I can stay on a little bit longer if you would like. Oh, Jenna, you need the link yet. Okay. Um, it should be at the very top of the chat. If you're not seeing it, let me add it again. That's not a problem. I also added one on social emotional learning from Dr. Lynn Kenny. I'm going to try to go back to the top of the chat. Okay, here it is. And I will add it down here again for you. There you go. There's today's slide deck so that you can get it, Jenna. Kathy, once again, thanking. And Jenna, thanks for joining us today. So glad to see you on board, ladies. And I'll get to any new messages in case I missed anything. Okay. Okay. Yep, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Okay. Well, I will let you go if there's no other questions, but have a wonderful day, everyone. And we look forward to you joining in for our future Q and Microsoft sessions. Each and every day, we've got so many creative topics to share with you, and it's going to continue all summer long. So thanks for joining again.